So for our first official assignment, which will be a little bit more involved, we have a little bit longer to work on than an exercise, but not that much longer, you are going to composite together from at least five references, but honestly, you're probably going to use more like 10 by the end of the project, including kind of cloud textures and color filters. But you want at least five major components like puzzle pieces to come together to make this landscape. It's a fantasy landscape can be anything that doesn't exist in the real world. So we're not just matching a real location. And you want to first think about the, the when when you're thinking of a fantasy landscape. So one way to make something a fantasy is you say, oh, I want to do ancient Egypt. And I want it to be in the past, you know, at the height of the Middle Kingdom. And that's not something we can go take a photo of, right? So that's something we would have to like research, create and find elements. Um, the other is the where. So think of the geography, and that has to do with like the climate, that has to do with the atmospheric, um, the materials, just all the factors. If, it's, if the where is on the planet Earth, or something very, very similar to Earth, then is it up high? Is it down low? Is it underwater? Is it subterranean? Is it urban? Is it forest? Is it mountains? Is it glaciers? All that kind of thing, right? That can help you. Sometimes it helps to think of things like the temperature, the time of day. So the when is not only is it in the past or is it in the future, is it in the present, but also what time of the day is it? If it's on a different planet, what are the different celestial bodies? What are the light sources? You know, what does that even mean? So it's, it's good to think about that. And then the last is the, the how. How does this environment operate, right? So if it's an icy environment, you get to kind of play with the physics a little bit, right? But it still needs to make sense to us visually. Are we going to have solid ice structures and then also running waterfalls? So you think, okay, well, how does that work? Well, then the waterfalls probably need to be something that's not the same substance as the solid ice, right? So maybe you play with different colors. So maybe the ice is like multicolored and the water is regular color. Or maybe the water is like syrup colored, you know, and it has a different freezing temperature. So that's the kind of thing that subtly makes a fantasy landscape believable when you think through those things. And we want these to look like believable landscapes that they follow their own logic. And that's why we're not going to put like SpongeBob's house next to a photograph of a volcano, you know, because that doesn't match the same kind of shared reality. If we want to make a fantasy landscape where it all looks like SpongeBob's house, then that's a good challenge, but we'll be more limited in the kind of resources we can find, right? And you can take from things like video games, you can take from things like wallpapers, you can take from all the different kind of travel photos that are out there, especially in Pixabay that are high resolution but you want them to be high quality. And once you kind of know those decisions, like this one I knew I wanted kind of an arid desert. Uh, this one the student knew they wanted like just massive mountains and glaciers. This one, the one I passed around, they knew they wanted like post-apocalyptic urban. And so they took things from Chicago, from Seattle, from lots of different sites, from different um, sources they found. These ones, you know, this could be a night shot. This can be a sunrise shot. You want to think through all that stuff. And then this is actually how it works. So I actually get a lot of inspiration. This is one of my demos from animation landscapes and background paintings. Because often those background paintings, whether it's for Looney Tunes or Disney cartoons, they, they effortlessly do this thing of three layers of depth with foreground, middle ground, and background. And so you want that. You want clear foreground, clear middle ground, clear background to get the most depth in your landscape. And that makes it the most versatile as a concept design. And then how do you go about it? So you start searching for images. I'll demonstrate that. I'll, I'm going to use Pixabay because they're copyright open. And they're already large enough and high quality enough. You know, they've been vetted. But you can also use Google Images. Just make sure you're, they're large enough. Make sure you check the, the pixel quality before you actually download them. 
by by uh, by opening the image in a new tab and zooming in on it. But it's not like you're going to take one of these images. Can't make it any bigger. But it's not like you're going to take one of these images and then place like trees on it, like stickers on a sticker sheet. Because then you're not creating the landscape, right? And we want to transform the, the references we use into something original. So that's why I want at least five sources. And I want your sketch to kind of show how those five or six or seven, however many you use, at least five, come together to make the image. And if you really want to challenge yourself, which I encourage, it will make your project better. It's good to sketch it both in a horizontal format with the elements you found that you want to use and in a vertical format. And I'll be demonstrating this. So you can see that. And then once you have the sketches, you can pick the one that you think is the most interesting to work on. Right? There are challenges to both. So you see the sketches, you see the sometimes sketches will have notes on them. You can digitally sketch, you can hand sketch. I don't see a, a distinction for this step. It does not need to be high resolution because like our basic emojis, this will just be like a template for what we bring our high resolution images onto. It's like having a, a tracing paper outline of the puzzle that then we put the pieces into. Okay, and then of course you can go to Imgur and you can see uh, other past examples, ones that made it into students' final portfolios. And there are two things that you submit for this, your sketch and then your finished composite. Your sketch or sketches and then your finished composite. So this one is kind of a tricky one. I think it works, but you want to avoid what's called figurative elements. So all of these, you'll notice there are no people, there are no animals, there are no vehicles that are operational vehicles. You might see like ruined vehicles, but there's nothing that you would expect to be moving when you look at it so that it doesn't immediately take you out of the believability of the scene because something's frozen still that you expect to be moving. And that's because these are background plates. So yes, planets will move across the sky, but they move slow enough that it's still believable as a scene. This one, though, has waterfalls. And waterfalls are tricky because we expect water to be moving. So if the waterfall was in the foreground, which I think uh, was in the original sketch for it, then that becomes something you can't really use all that well as a background plate, right? Because you can have like a creature animated in it, but then the water is not moving. So then you have the extra work of always have, also having to animate the water. So try to avoid figurative elements. Animation is another good reference for this. If it's uh, urban rather than only nature, if you have man-made elements, it makes your job a little bit harder because then you need to match it to linear perspective. And so I'm all for your using man-made ele elements like this bridge and these cities, but they I, I'm always going to encourage you to nest them into organic material because it, it helps make that perspective more believable. Right? And we can talk more about that. So I want to hear your questions. You don't just start sketching. You start thinking about your idea. And I'm, I'm probably going to sketch it all out on the whiteboard for you at the beginning of next class. Maybe I can even do it now and then just take a photo of that and, and use that as my sketch instead of sketching digitally. And just because when I sketch digitally in front of you, it takes me a long time to do the writing. <laughs> For some reason, that takes a long time with my brush settings. But this is what a digital sketch might look like. But the first thing you want to do is, is figure out this stuff, your theme, your setting, your time frame. I call it the circumstance, but that's like the how. How is this possible? And then you start looking up things. So I already have some inspiration in mind. That's another way you can start, is look for inspiration. And the inspiration I decided on was, I haven't done a forest, I don't think, in any of my demos, because it's particularly hard to cut out trees with all the little shapes and composite with them. But I, I want to 
I want to try to do some sort of forest. Maybe be a forest of like weird dead trees or something that's easier to select. So let's see. So I found these references. I just did a general concept art search for like a dark, colorful forest. I wanted that contradiction in there and to see what I got. And these were some of the ones I thought were interesting. So I'm not going to be matching any of these, but I want to show you kind of the strengths and the weaknesses in these kind of fantasy landscapes, whether they come from children's books, whether they come from uh, desktop wallpapers, whatever. What this one does well is foreground, middle ground, background, right? Uh, what it does well is it really makes you, it makes it easy to extend what you see and imagine what's going on outside of those borders, especially with the, the vines here and kind of soft focus. So you have this very strong foreground elements. So it hints at this, this whole kind of mushroom city while only having to actually show us a handful of actual mushroom houses. And then it, it goes pretty quickly into a soft focus, you know, brightly lit background, which softens edges and makes it a lot easier to hide a lot of stuff there. This one's a little bit moodier, and I dig that. I also like how it plays with scale, so where the huge tree is actually a background element. It's like so huge that it's, it's mixing in the colors of the atmosphere. And how the foreground element is super simple. It's just these grasses. And then the thing that's most in focus, most contrasted, most clearly defined is the middle ground, which is where you have, they have a figurative element. We wouldn't do a figurative element, but it could be like a really interesting rock formation or a really interesting bush or a really interesting piece of broccoli, you know, whatever you want to use it would be there. But I like how, how they're playing with the color. The color kind of shifts from one side to the other. That could be inspirational. And then we have some video game design concept art, which is really close to reality, right? You can see how this is almost just kind of a sketchbook from Brazil with the topography and the, but then they just do this kind of unexpected scale and color choice where these palms these ground palms are way, way bigger than you expect them to be. And because of that, they're pushed into the middle ground rather than the foreground. And when you put a figure in there, again, we're going to activate our landscapes with, with figurative content later. But that really shows how this is kind of a fantasy land instead of something. So sometimes the imagery you're going to use is pretty typical imagery. You're just going to scale it differently, color it differently position it differently in your sketches. So that's what I want to be inspired by. So I'm going to pause the video here. So we've just got a few more minutes. So this is a super helpful idea. Is you take the piece of paper, I can't even stress how important this is. And still students will just like fill up their sketchbook. But you take it and then you actually make the boxes inside of it. There's so many reasons to do that. Because then you can kind of like change it, change the parameters if you want. You can make notes. And you don't need to draw this big. This can be super simple. So if I do an image search for unusual trees, and I think, okay, that's going to be my middle ground, like focal point. How do you draw it? You just kind of see what's there that you like. Like, I think that's pretty cool. And I'm not even doing a search yet. I should be. For like the large images. So I would go to tools and I would limit it by size. And ideally I would do this in Pixabay and not have to worry about it. But luckily, this is why we start with landscape. There's a lot of large resolution landscape out there. This one's cool. This is already like a neighborhood with these like crazy trees. Right. It's and then right. and it's it's over two thousand pixels. One dimension, so as long as it's not in a web format that I can't steal. And it's a little blurry, and it's not. It's in a regular format. You know, this might be useful, right? So how do you sketch it? If I wanted to use some of this, 